All right, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Uh, hopefully, you know, the information that you're going to learn in the class that I'm teaching today follows up on what you've heard from Hubert and Barry, and it's all going to work together. You know, as Barry mentioned, uh, you really have to keep things clean. You know, no one thing is going to make you money. And what you're going to see today with the charts and the trades that I'm using for today's presentation is that there's not a lot of indicators on these charts. You know, we're basically kind of trading naked here, where I don't have a lot of things like the moving averages, you know, even volume for the most part isn't going to be on, you know, really a focus of many of these charts, because I want to show you guys how to look at pure price development, and once you have a grasp of understanding how trends work and how momentum works, that's going to clue you into where you can start to add back some of those indicators. And your indicators are going to serve as confirmation tools. You know, they can be great visual representations for what's going on in the market. But if you don't understand the basics of price development and, you know, the underlying concepts like those building blocks that, you know, he talked about, then you're really not going to get too far. You're going to completely second guess yourself half the time or you're going to rely on the wrong indicator at the wrong time. So today, the focus is going to be upon trading trend exhaustion and looking at trends and trend moves from both sides. So when I'm talking about trend exhaustion, I'm talking about not only where I'm going to be taking my gains and exiting a position that I already have, but also how to look at, you know, what's going to be my next trade or even the two to three trades that follow. Because a good trend trader is going to understand not just what's happening right now in the market, but what the next several moves in the market are most likely to be and have a pretty good understanding as to the probability of what those moves will be. And you're going to see that in some of the trades that I'm going to show you today where I taught this class uh, for the first time about a month ago. So I like to use things where uh, the examples that I'm using in one class often have like some, you know, forward thinking action in them to use for the following classes so that you guys see that what is happening now in the market is something that's happened so many times in the past. It's very repetitive. You know, I'm the, the same tools and techniques that I've used for the last two decades are the same ones that I use now. Obviously, my understanding has expanded greatly over the years, and I'm continuing to learn new things about the market. But the core factors are still there, and they're going to be things that you can take to trade any market. So I know, you know, not everyone here is just a stock trader. You know, some of you are pure options traders, some of you are trading futures, some of you are trading forex, uh, bonds, oil. You know, I started as a stock trader, uh, focusing mainly on swing trading, very quickly ended up adding in futures trading, day trading futures, from that when it's Forex, and now I pretty much trade every market using the same strategies. So it doesn't matter which time frame you trade on or which market you trade on. The system that I'm going to show you today is one that you can use to apply to all of those markets. So let's start to dive in here and get looking at some of these slides that I put for today. So. The, the big question that a lot of trend traders have is, you know, how predictable is the end of a trend? Getting into a trend, you're going to find a lot of setups, a lot of strategies, you know, breakout strategies, ABCs, you know, you name it. You've probably heard dozens of, you know, strategy names that you can tick off, you know, cup with handles, head and shoulders, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine, you know, you you can go ahead, get into a trade, but then the biggest problem so many traders have once they're already in that position is where to get out. You know, how do you know how long to hold a position? Uh, you don't want to get in, get out too early because you don't want to miss, you know, the great portion of a move, but you also don't want to be too late because as you can see here, let me just grab a pen. You know, once the market decides to turn, 
a lot of these pullbacks and corrections can be very, very rapid. So if you miss those turns, trying to get out can be incredibly difficult, especially if you're a newer trader and you don't understand you know, the levels of which levels are going to hold versus which might give you a bounce back into those highs. So the, the trades that I'm going to show you today, you know, I do a lot of posts on uh, social media following the markets. And over the summer, I posted several major re reversal and correction periods on the market. What will stand out is that I didn't post any such posts in between these key pivotal points. So can you really predict trend exhaustion? Absolutely. I made three posts regarding trend exhaustion on the market, and over that time, each of those three are the ones that held exactly. So we're going to talk about you know, what went into those predictions and how you can use those same things that I used so that you can trade what's happening right now in the market. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that are going on right now as well when we get towards the end of this presentation. So here's, you know, these are the, the quotes of exactly what I wrote at the time. You know, market shift, momentum is shifting. We're going to talk about what momentum means and the role that momentum plays in predicting highs and lows. Uh, expect a, a, another correction on the daily charts. You know, look for momentum or pace to slow on the upside. That's another way that the market can correct. So when we look at the different ways corrections can occur, there's two predominant methods. They're either going to correct via time or predominantly via price. That means that you know if correction occurs mostly through time, you're looking at a pullback where there's a lot of back and forth action. Um, you might have a lot of overlap from one bar to the next, and even though it might correct through price as well, it's not going to be as rapid, or it will drop quickly and then fall into more of a consolidation. You know, obviously, all corrections have some parts of both in play, but there's usually one that dominates, and momentum is what determines that dominant route. So you can also think of momentum as pace, and it's basically how prices shift over time. So when we look at the types of corrections, here are a couple of examples. The ones that are in red are corrections you know, through price, and the ones in blue are corrections in time. And you'll see a bit of both. So a correction in time doesn't necessarily mean that a security is pulling back strongly in terms of price. It could just be a place where the market slows the trend. So you might get more overlap from one bar to the next. This is what you know I showed you guys on the, the chart heading into the last month or so, the type of correction that we kicked off here uh, at the end of the summer, began with a correction through uh, time, where it continued to make some higher highs for a few days before finally starting to pull back in price. Now, corrections more through price will often have some of these stronger drops. Now, this one is a bit of a combination of through time and price because it took longer to pull back just a portion of the previous impulse move on the upside. So overall, this was correction through both time and price that allowed for the trends to eventually continue on the upside. Let's clear this here. Here's another example of a correction that took place through time, where it hit resistance at the previous highs and continued to try to inch higher, but really couldn't push through that resistance level. And we're going to look at this type of correction through time in a little bit more detail because it's a specific reversal pattern that I call a momentum reversal. What that means is that you are looking at a shift in momentum that can lead to a really strong 
strong reversal in that momentum. It usually begins with a sharp upside move, if you're looking at a momentum reversal to the downside, followed by a series of highs where you have three highs in a trading channel. So it kind of looks like a flag or a hockey puck, um, something like that, golf club if it's at the lows. And when that breaks, you'll usually get a pretty strong, rapid flush to the downside. So when we're looking at momentum shifting, this is one very important type of momentum shift that is really common heading into a lot of these reversals and a lot of the corrections in the market, especially the extremely rapid ones like what took place here back in May. Here's another combination where we see a correction begin through price and it continues with a little bit, or a correction rather, through time, and it continues with a little bit more of a correction through price. So overall, it ends up being a correction through price because it falls more into, or, or through time rather, because it falls more into a trading range over the course of about a month, but it has aspects of both. So when you hear me talk about, um, I'm expecting a correction to take place. There's going to be a couple ways that I'm going to be looking for that correction to take place. If the momentum is very strong on the upside, you'll usually have a couple of types of reversals or corrections. It'll be more of a slower correction like that, where it pulls back more gradually, or it'll be one where the momentum on the upside shifts, and that kind of lead to the stronger pullbacks and the stronger corrections. So we'll look at a bit of both here. When we're looking at momentum, it can, it can really be your best friend or your worst enemy. And the factor where it's the most important is going to be the very end of a trend. So momentum can shift on the smaller time frames, even though something looks strong on like a daily time frame or a weekly time frame, for example, if you're not using like a 60 minute or even 120 minute, you can miss those shifts and momentum as the market is hitting highs or hitting lows and poising itself for a reversal or for some type of correction through time. So when you're looking at a move, even though this shift in momentum here is very obvious, you also have a shift in momentum that's taking place right here, where if you transect this trend channel between the highs and the lows, you have a shift in momentum compared to the initial impulse move that took place heading into this first high, followed by a second high, and then a third high. And a lot of traders, they will ignore that fact. They'll pay attention to, okay, this move is still really strong. This move is still really strong. This one was weaker. This one is weaker. So I really need to keep looking on the upside. But that's not the case. Instead, this is showing us that the market is exhausting and that we really should be starting to turn over and look at corrective moves instead. There's going to be exceptions to this. In fact, I'm going to show you an exception here a little bit later on. Uh, you know, this is where finding a mentor and somebody that can help you learn these exceptions is so important because you can, you can really decrease your uh, learning curve by helping helping yourself uh, by picking up the things that, you know, a lot of traders like myself have taken dozens of years to learn through trial and error. You can, for example, this, if this takes place where we had a really strong downtrend, it bounces, and you see this happening, it might actually be acting more like a bull flag than it would be a stronger reversal pattern. And I'm going to show you that example here a little bit later on. So trend placement is very important when you're looking at momentum as well. Moving on, when we, you know, I mentioned transecting a trend. 
to see momentum a little bit more clearly. What transecting a trend means is basically drawing a line right through the middle of most of these bars in a trend move and ignoring the extremes, like the tails on the top and the bottom. So if I'm drawing a transection of a trend, I want to look at the smaller trends within a larger trend. Here's the larger trend itself. But in order to time exhaustion, we need to look at the smaller impulse moves that are taking place within that trend. And an impulse move is a strong momentum move within a trend. And they happen on multiple time frames. So this is a 60-minute chart. And the impulse moves are going to be things like this drop here, the move on the upside here, the continuation moves, and then these moves on the downside are also impulse moves. And you'll notice that when the momentum is very similar, the impulse moves tend to be very similar as well. So if you have, for example, a momentum move here on the downside, these are taking place over just a couple of bars. So when you look back at previous moves that only took place over a couple of bars, you'll notice that the size of those impulse moves are also very comparable. And that's going to help clue you in to when a trend could be coming to an end as well. Because if you're seeing previous impulse moves that are very similar to what's happening right now in the market and a trade that you're in, that's when you need to be dropping down to those smaller time frames and looking for those shifts in momentum that can clue you in for a reversal strategy. So many positions when I'm day trading, it's not uncommon that I might take gains on a position but actually close the trade out with twice as many shares or uh, twice as many contracts as I had on the previous position because I'm actually reversing it. That's not at all uncommon and I can time it incredibly well for some of these strategies like that momentum reversal that I talked about because they are so incredibly predictable. It's one of the, the my favorite strategies for teaching newer traders just because it does have such a high level of predictability and once you know all the ins and outs for how to trade it and the rules for trading it, it's very simple to stick to as well and you know not mistake uh, you know one of those indicators and second guess yourself. When we're looking at these trends, paying attention to the last portion of the trend is very, very important. You know, that previous slide that I showed you here, you can see that it had three waves of buying on the upside. It had an initial move, a little bit of a shifted momentum here because, again, it's coming off the lows of a trend where it was already trending on the downside. So it created this as more of a, a bull flag. And then it had a secondary wave and then the third wave. That third wave is what we were looking at on the 15-minute chart where we're dropping down and that also had three waves of upside. Now, following that, as this trend began to exhaust itself, that momentum slowed. So even though the initial impulse move was a really strong one, the second and third one started to shift and started to change. And I have another slide here. Let's see if it's the next slide I wanted to show you. Oh, we'll get to it here in a second, actually. Where when we look at you know, the last portion of a trend, that's going to tell you, you know, how is a correction more likely to play out. So when a, when a trend move is really strong, where you have an impulse move that is you know, comparable to previous impulse moves, usually that's going to try to correct more through time than through price. So if it has an initial price pullback, that's a sharp price pullback, it's more likely to pull back up into that drop and fall into a longer trading range. So these V 
pivots, where you have a pivot high and a pivot low. These so-called V pivots are very indicative of something where it's going to fall into a longer trading range. And then as that range progresses, you watch for those smaller movements within it to give you a clue for which way that range is going to break. Is it going to break to the downside? which it will usually do with a two-wave move, it, meaning it might try a fake, a false breakout on the upside, pull back in, shift momentum, and then break lower. Or it could also shift momentum by doing this, where this entire breakout move is more gradual than this previous move over here. Even though it had a, an okay initial breakout move, the momentum was stronger it, or stronger in these previous impulse moves than it was here. So if I clear this, you can see that better. There were smaller bars, more overlap from bar to bar, and just greater hesitancy, which was even more apparent with the choppier trading here in pre-market. So coming out of that, the momentum continued to shift where it tried a sharp breakout, put in a V, pulled back up, slowed with that momentum reversal on the smaller time frame, dropped, and then shifted momentum again. So here are the two levels you would be looking for for a reversal strategy. The first coming out of this smaller momentum reversal right here, it's a little bit hard to see on the 15-minute chart, but it's actually there, and you'd see it on a five-minute. And then the initial continuation to that momentum reversal, which is a strategy that I call an avalanche. For very obvious reasons, once it gets going, it tends to go pretty quickly. So this shift in momentum we're going to get back to. First... Let's look a little bit more at these momentum shifts. So when we look at these V pivots, you can see here that when I was teaching the class uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, this is the activity that we were looking at going into that class right here, circled at the very end. And we were starting to get these V pivots again. So coming off of the short, and corrections, this V activity indicated that we'd be more likely to see a trading range continue for a bit. That ended up happening over the course of several days where trading range tightened and it becomes more difficult to get strong intraday trends. So if you're looking at a time frame and you see a V back and forth action, it might look like a, a backwards N, for example, that's usually going to be followed by more chop or more difficult trading where you're not even going to get the strong moves like you had back and forth within the V itself. It's a time where it becomes better to sit on the sidelines and look for momentum start to change on the smaller time frames to position yourself in the direction of where this longer channel is likely to break. Knowing when that might break is something that is very predictable. And it has to do with time development. So that's one of those building blocks of price development that I use in all of my trading. And it has to do with how long these corrections take compared to average. So when you look at an impulse move in the market, such as this one here, you want to see how long does that take before you see another impulse move take place. And look at that time development there. In this case, you're looking at, oh, about a month and a half, maybe close to two months. We have another zone of congestion here where we see basically a little head and shoulders pattern that formed. So that whole period from the slowdown in momentum right here to the break coming off of the low here, is another zone of correction. So that tells you, okay, you'd be looking for right around in there before you would see another continuation move. I'll hold on just a second here, guys. I'm gonna grab a sip of water.
We have all that smoke hitting us from the wildfires out in Montana. I'm up here in Columbus, Ohio right now. So it's been some orange and asthma -y, asthma -y days here the last couple of days. So I apologize if I need to take a break every once in a while here. Oh gosh, yeah, I feel for you guys over out west. <laughs> it's so horrible. Let me clear this up and move on to the next slide because that's going to show us what has happened. So coming out of this, here's your V's where we have the, the move off the lows and then the move off the highs. So basically that backwards end type of formation I was just talking about. And this is where you're not going to get as strong moves for a little bit of time coming off of that. And usually that little bit of time means the entire time that you had the, these two V's form, whether it's the valley or the peak, usually you can take approximately that same amount of time and add that on and that can be how long it will take before you see another strong move that is similar to each of these trends. So for us, here's the momentum shift that I started to look for. You know, right here, this little uh, chart down here marked H, I stuck that in to show you where the initial class was that I taught and where we were at in the pattern development at that point. So right after that, as it began to approach these previous lows, we started to see that momentum shifting, where it put in the three lows, that momentum reversal strategy I talked about, and led to a little bit of an initial bounce. <clears throat> now because this has already had a strong pivot low and a strong pivot high, creating this backwards formation, backwards N, it's going to be harder to continue to go all the way up to these previous highs as quickly as it did in each of these moves. Instead, it's more common that you will see it stop halfway, just like we saw here, and then see more of that time correction that I talked about. So this ended up playing out heading into the end of last month, where even though we saw some sharp intraday drops, overall, the trend movement just wasn't as strong as we had seen earlier in the month. And so this means that for those of you that focus on swing trades, you have to take a step back and realize, okay, it might be a good time to start to build into a position when you start to see momentum begin to change, or you might just want to wait on the sidelines until such time as it's going to be likely that you're going to see that breakout happen based upon the time development that I just talked about in the previous slide. So after it took a little bit of time to develop, then we were able to see another three-wave breakout to the upside. Again, momentum shifting here uh, heading into this month. <clears throat> now, what about that trend. You know, you guys hear the word trend over and over again. You hear three waves, two waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, trends aren't always that easy to read, especially if you're a newer trader or you're you're trying to understand a market that is getting really choppy. But even in a difficult market, the rules of trends still persist. They might just not be as obvious. So what I'm going to show you guys here as we go forward into the next part of this class is looking at how these trends can display themselves, even though they might be a little bit quote unquote trickier, once you learn to understand these tricky trends, they're going to be very obvious. You're going to start to see them pop up over and over again, and it's going to be substantially less confusing. Basically, you just want to think in terms of twos and threes. And sometimes there's fours, but that's another class <laughs> we don't have time to get into here now. Um, so we're going to focus on kind of the basic trend development and how you can see adjustments in that trend development based on the momentum. So here was very recent action in the market. We're looking at the ES, and we had an initial run-up, strong 
initial impulse move, two wave correction. Very, very typical trend type of action. So in a two wave correction, as long as it holds within that upper 50% of the initial impulse move, you're usually going to get a break to a new high. Notice the second impulse move. The momentum is very similar to the first, so you are able to get almost a measured move or equal, equal move coming out of that low. When we go into the next move here, we again have a two-way correction. This time the second correction is slower than the first, which is a great time to kind of, this is one of those occasions where you can start to build into a position before you have a pure breakout. A lot of breakout traders, they'll draw a trend line above this congestion and they'll go ahead and get in on a break of that. The problem of that, of course, is that you're chasing your trades. You know, by the time you get into a position, if you have a stop under the lows of this, you might already have left half the move on the table. And you can tell how much you might have left on the table by looking at where your entry is compared to those previous impulse moves. Now this one did not quite hit a measured move because the momentum began to shift midway. So it actually ended up slowing and not quite hitting that equal measured move. Even though it was still a pretty decent move, you know, we got a, a couple of points here on the 15 minute time frame, <clears throat> a couple of pips. So uh, when we go forward, after that third wave, you're usually going to be looking at a longer correction. So if the time development between each of these moves is similar, roughly similar, what tends to happen is after a third move, you'll get a longer correction. If it tries to go right away, let's say it takes this time development into here, and you try to see another breakout here for a fourth wave on the upside, that has the greater chance of being a trap. So what will usually happen is the momentum coming out of this. You might still get a strong momentum move, but you also have a greater chance of it just pulling up a little bit and then turning around and pulling back. And I'll, I'll show you actually uh, one very good example of this here in just a second. <clears throat> Another way a trend can inform can unfold though is within those momentum reversals, that momentum reversal strategy. You're still thinking in terms of counting. So one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two for the corrective moves. Usually in between each of these, you'll see that two-wave correction. You'll just have to drop down to a smaller time frame to see it. Within an initial upside move heading into this shift, you might get two waves or three waves. And it really can depend. You don't have to always have three waves in a trend move to the upside. What might happen is that each of the impulse moves within a larger trend that does have three waves might only have two waves. And it might have a situation where it goes up, bases, and goes up again. So you'll have like a narrow range day. And this is what I call a one, two, three pattern. It's a continuation type of pattern. You'll see it when you know, the momentum is the strongest. But by hitting that third high, where within the momentum shift here, that's a key indication that you're going to be looking at either a reversal or something that can go into more of a trading range for a bit of a longer term, depending on where this happens within the larger trend channel. So as a trend channel becomes more extended, or as a trend becomes more extended, the greater the chance of these momentum reversal strategies leading to major trend reversals. So if this has already had you know, several waves of upside, that makes this a much stronger reversal strategy. And if this section here is very comparable to previous correction periods in the market over time, like that, then it has an even greater chance of being a strong reversal for the trend. If on the other hand, this is pretty short compared to previous corrective periods, then that can mean that this can fall into a longer channel, or it could take longer to reverse, or it might even fall into a base where the momentum within it starts to change. So this might pull back sharply to start with, 
but then it ends up basing out and continuing the trend a little bit later on. So trend placement is very, very important, as well as that time development factor. <clears throat> and here's another example. Here's uh, the Euro Yen, and this was uh, another a piece of the market that was happening back in my previous class. And I wanted to show them how the same thing can happen on different time frames and different markets. This one happened in the dollar yen, where again, we had the initial impulse move on the downside, and then these three lows that formed. What you can see here very clearly though, is that even though the channel has changed a little bit, it's not a strong momentum shift. If we look at this low here for the first low and compare it to the third low, and look at that move compared to this entire drop here, that's still a pretty good drop to new lows. What happens when the momentum isn't shifting on the smaller time frames, meaning we still have slower upside and stronger downside, even though the larger time frame is showing a bit of a shift. It's not going to lead to the strong reversals most of the time. What will usually happen is you'll fall into these Vs. A lot of times the Vs can be bigger too, so like they can widen up, go like this. So you can get some strong swings there, but you're usually not going to get a strong trend that would be comparable to a previous impulse move. So when we look at that and how that played out, you'll see that it did exactly what was anticipated. It formed that V at the highs. Now granted, it slowed a little bit here, so it could have broken on the downside. It actually did with a little bit of a tail for a little two-wave move to the downside. But it pulled back up and again, back down here into today. So we are getting more of that correction over time as opposed to to a correction through price. Through price, it's only on the smaller time frames. So over time, this is now something we have to drop down and watch for those shifts in momentum on like a 60 minute time frame or even a 30 minute time frame to give us an indication of, okay, you know what, where is this gonna go now? And of course you can use those larger daily and weekly charts to give you a bigger picture as well. I've actually uh, restarted my Friday trading group where it's a forward focus group where we look at the markets going forward and based upon the multiple time frames, looking at all different kinds of markets actually. Um, if you're interested in that, you know, Keep hanging on to the end of uh, today, and I'll give you information on that. It's totally free, so anyone can drop by and uh, view it, ask questions. Uh, you'll find that it is very accurate. Um, you know, I have over 20 years of trading experience live, and well over 10 years, I was literally in the market 16 hours a day. I ran a trading room all day and worked the markets most of the night as well. Lived, breathed, and ate and slept trading, even in my dreams. So you're going to find that uh, you know, a lot of work has gone into understanding the markets based upon this pure price action. When we go forward here, I want to show you another uh, thing that's happening here. So here we're looking at uh, the Kiwi greenback, and that's the NZD New Zealand dollar against the US dollar. And we have very similar action unfolding on the daily time frame. So let me ask you guys a question. What do you think is going to happen with this currency pair? Based upon what I've talked about in just the last couple of slides, where do you think this is gonna go this week? We'll see how many of you are paying attention here. <laughs> David is the closest, chopped up. So we have 
when we look at what's happened here and we transect this move, we have a, sl we have a little bit of a slowdown compared to this impulse move on the downside, but it's not that substantial. We're still seeing slower upside in here within this momentum reversal attempt. What that means, and and Amit has it really close on, is more probably more likely to get sideways type of action here, where it's going to be choppier. Just like what we saw, I'll actually flip back to the previous slide. You guys can see it right here. Where we are at right now in the Kiwi is right about in here, where this is the type of action that we can possibly see, you know, very easily start to see over the next week or two. It's most likely to be a choppier market environment. We can get those bigger V pivots to begin with. So it can work for intraday traders where you can get some strong intraday trend moves. But as that continues to play out, it's going to be harder. So you are more likely to get chopped up if you're trying to trade those smaller time frames after these first couple attempts to pivot back and forth. So this is a good time, you know, to really drop down to those smaller time frames. If this had been a situation where, you know, the shift had been a little bit greater and we saw momentum starting to change within this boot portion itself, where the last move to the third low was slower than the impulse move, that sets the way for these stronger reversals. Usually it's going to pop, run into resistance here, and then try to move higher. So you'll see kind of like an upside down head and shoulders pattern, or you could get like a cup with handle, those type of things. That's what can happen coming out of this. So, and clear this up here. As we're watching that, you know, you can really use what you've seen in the market pattern as a very good indication for what's going to happen in the future. Um, let me change here. So, you know, if we look at up close at the last daily correction call I had, and that one was taking place back in here. So we were back in here, and I posted on Twitter, you know, that we needed to look for the uptrend to start to shift, to the you know, momentum to slow, and begin to look for reversal strategies. And the reason I wasn't looking initially for a sharp shorting strategy at that point was because upside momentum was still pretty steady. There wasn't a shift in momentum yet on those smaller time frames heading into this level. You can see they're all pretty steady on the upside. So I needed to drop down to the smaller time frames to watch for that. And as it was starting, the corrections were still pretty slow. Uh, you know, more of sideways type of move. There wasn't really a lot of indication that we could get a strong momentum move on the downside. But in that last section here, it pulled back here, came up slowly, based, how to move up here, so transecting this entire move was slower than these average impulse moves in the past, and it had a two-wave move to the upside within this third move to highs, just like it did back in here, a little bit harder to see because we're, we're looking at such a, a larger time frame, but by looking at those two waves, that tells us, okay, you know what, at that point, we're ready. The distance between these highs is very similar, so we've got that time development factor that I talked about that is so important, and we have that momentum factor. So all of these came together to give us those reversal strategies just a few days after. So we were looking initially, I was looking initially at momentum to change. That took a couple of days. And then that gave us the reversal strategies coming off of that. So here's where it was on that larger time frame.
And when we go back and look at this tricky trend development, what I want to show you is the 15-minute chart leading up to this and le leading up to the reversal. We had a shift in momentum taking place on these smaller time frames where we had like that, that first three-way move on the upside that we talked about, and then we have a two-wave breakout to new highs. So this is coming off an even larger trend where it had three moves on the upside, and momentum was beginning to shift overall. When momentum shifts, corrections can change. So you can switch from a three-wave trend move to a two-wave trend move, where it's trying to hit those higher highs, but it's just not able to do so. And instead of having three waves on a breakout, like you might have seen through each of the previous impulse moves, you end up seeing two major waves instead. So if you look at another example of this, you can see here, this goes back to the June correction call. And the June correction call, the market had already started to slow. It was falling into a third channel where it had already had two periods of correction before. The first period of correction, I hinted at this earlier in today, where when you have a trade, a trend that is coming off of lows, you might get get that shift in momentum, but you won't see like the sharper change within it. So it doesn't form necessarily a momentum reversal. It treats the shift as moment in momentum as if it's a trading channel because the interest is so strong coming off of that lows that instead of falling flat or falling into a little bit of a price pullback, it treats that first zone just the same way as it would if this were a base. So when you're looking at time development, you look for when that zone started to slow compared to when it broke out. So that gives you a time correction lasting about four days. So coming off that second impulse move, which is a measured move compared to the first, you'd be looking for about four days for a strong breakout. If you try it too early, you're going to usually get trapped and you can even risk getting flushed. That's what happened here. You know, this in this case it was a gap higher, so hopefully there weren't as many people trapped, but that's exactly what happened there. It was too early, uh, too early to try for that third move. Now when it did that extra four day move here, you can see again, tried a little bit early, but it just created trap patterns before it fell to the downside. And what happened within this is that you actually have a two-wave correction, just like we saw in that previous chart, at these highs, where that whole move shifted the momentum within this time correction to allow for a really sharp breakdown. Um, this move, you know, happened to have some news come on the heels of it as well, but the post for that correction, the post for the trade happened before the news even hit the wires. The news just propelled it even farther, and you're going to see that happening a lot. A lot of times when bad news hits the market, there's already a setup developing or forming that allows that news to just run, and that's what we saw happening here. So, you know, what's next? You know, I've covered a lot of material today, and you know, as you go back and review the, the recording for today's session, you probably pick up on new things the second time, even the third time around. Um, well, I do have a live class that's going to be coming up here in Chicago in just a couple of weeks, and actually, we have a lot of people that are going to be there, a lot of great uh, industry traders and educators, Hubert, uh, Sergey, they're all going to be there. And I'm going to be presenting on Trading Naked. <laughs> so it's a pro's guide to trading pure price action. So we're going to be looking at how to read pure price action sans indicators, you know, grasp the fundamentals of price development, understand why sometimes even the best indicators will fail you and learn how indicators can act as excellent visual confirmation tools. 
when they are used at the right time. I, you know, those that have been with me for years, you know that I do use indicators and I, I teach other traders how to use indicators as well. But in my own trading, I don't use them as much. I like to use them to help other traders get on the right path by providing them with the correct <laughs> with the correct tools. Bruce says that that he has to have clothes, so I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> but uh, I really hope that you guys can join me and gals. We've got a lot of women that are going to be there as well. It is a two and a half day summit in Chicago from September 24th to 26th. And they just opened it up online as well. So we've got everything from stocks, futures, commodities. And what you're going to find is that my own trading style, like I told you, it covers all these markets. You know, for my options traders, it helps them know which contracts they need to take, um, where to place their hedges, and based upon what the expectations are. So we have so many things that we have to offer you guys for this and all of the speakers just keep adding stuff to this all the time. So the registration includes uh, an all access pass on site or online. It has recordings from all of the events and well over $2,000 in bonuses from all of the speakers. So the schedule is that there's opening night cocktail reception. Uh, we have my great friend Linda Rashke is going to be doing the keynote. Uh, Monday and Tuesday we have all day sessions going from 8 to 5 central time and I am going to be presenting my naked trading. I will be clothed though so sorry about that guys but you know I'm married not good to trade naked completely <laughs> but what you're going to get uh, for those of you that join me in Chicago or join me online is that I have some extra bonuses for you that are going to be signing up today. And you're going to receive um, three classes that I have. One is going to be getting in early on a trend day. So it's going to teach you some of the things that I talked about today, but go into a lot greater detail. You're also going to have a copy of three strategies you've been taught that will lose you money. This goes into strategies like the breakout trade, where you know traders are given this idea of how to trade a breakout based upon you know free knowledge that they're picking up online. It's drawing trend lines over the top, taking the breaks in prices. No, <laughs> I'm going to show you how to get into those trades correctly and the reasons that the typical ways that you will find them taught online just are not feasible for long-term success. And the next one is going to be three signs of trend exhaustion. So that goes into greater detail on what I talked about here today. It uses a lot of live trades that I had uh, as well and you know shows you different examples of how to trade these type of strategies. So I also have another thing that you know others that have signed up uh, you know aren't going to get. This is just for you guys um, that are signing up today. And that's I'm going to invite you to a free month of live uh, mentoring membership following Chicago. So this is going to include my Monday mentors. And during that, I have a full hour class of where I answer trader questions, you know, talking from everything about uh, psychology of trading. Um, you know, working with your partners in trading so that they have an understanding of the markets and, you know, can be supportive. It goes into specific strategy developments, uh, details on trade management. So each Monday basically has a specific topic, but then I answer any questions you guys have been sending me throughout the week as well. And then we have live trading on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and that goes from 9 to 11 every Tuesday and Thursday. Basically, we get to see all those strategies and everything playing out live in the markets. So running commentary and trades throughout that time. All different markets, too. So, you know, even if you trade futures, and I have a trade in Forex, what you're going to see is that 
the types of trades are going to translate into all markets. So you go back and you review those trades and you'll see that you know that's going to be the same type of strategy that you would apply to your own market as well and the next trade might be in that market. Then we have uh, Friday's forward focus group which I've already you know shared with you guys and we have a uh, premium daily videos Monday through Thursday where I'm going to be talking about what's going on in the market at that time and give you an outlook on you know the day and even the week or so ahead so that's something that will be coming up following Chicago so you guys will all have a free month of membership in that as well as the additional classes and because that's not enough we also have all of these other bonuses that the other speakers from Hubert to Sergey to Rob Hoffman have all agreed to add as well so take a look at those you can join me at tonyhanson.com backslash Chicago so very simple URL though there for you. Tony, Let me take a Dan, I hate to interrupt. Um, yeah. I just tried that link and it goes to our Market Fest registration page. Oh, hold I on, I want to double guys. check to see if you have a, another link that might work better. I do. What is with all of these missing links here? Hold on. I'm just the messenger. Okay. Yeah, I know. Okay, well, it's going to be working there here in a second. Let me grab the pure link for you. Yeah, and I'm going to take some questions, and then I'll, po I'll post the direct link in the uh, chat box here also so you guys have that. All right, so some of the questions you have really fast. Um, and if, you, if I don't get to your question, you can email me at Tony at tradingfrommainstreet.com. Let me type that in there for you also. So Tony at tradingfrommainstreet.com is my direct email. So I will get your questions there. So let's see. Do I consider volume when the trend goes as a large, uh, when the trend goes as large, selling will take place, I think. So volume is one of those um, building blocks of price development that I do rely on, but it's not the most important ones. It's one of those that I use as a confirmation tool, and it's very dependent. It's very price dependent. Um, so whatever, what else is going on in that trend will determine what is happening there you know as far as is volume really relevant is it not relevant some people have forex volume others don't if you don't have it it's not going to make a huge difference but there are certain strategies where if you watch the volume it can give you a really good indication of your if you're going to have very very strong follow-through or if it might be something that could be a, a more mild move uh, may I have a copy of your slides? Um, they are going to be uh, posting a recording of this, so you guys will be able to go back and review all of those slides when you know as soon as they have it online. And I will get that link to you as well, uh, posted for those of you that are on uh, my mailing list. You'll get a copy of it also. Let's see. Oh, thank you guys. I'm so glad that you loved it love today's class and um, let's see I think most of these I answered within the presentation itself so yeah if you have any other additional questions you know just shoot them on over and I'm going to send Dan that direct link for Chicago um, make sure you use the one that is the direct link that I send you otherwise you're not going to get uh, those extra bonuses from me so that's very important 